Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Lauren Schwiebert. I'm going to be hosting today, so you'll hear from me occasionally. Um, we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, James is going to um, continue uh, with with the discussion of the Jetscape software. Um, I wanted to uh, um, thank him again for an excellent talk yesterday. To remind everyone that if you could give any, if you have any feedback, suggestions on how things could be better or what have you, um, please use the Slack channel. Uh, there's a Slack channel called Welcome. Um, in addition, if you have any questions, please remember to uh, put them on Slack. We do have a breakout room again this morning. So if you're having issues with the software, uh, go on Slack, let someone know, and if necessary, we'll move you to the breakout room. Then finally, I wanted to remind you that if, if there's a question that we'd like to take a poll, yes or no, um, please click on participants and check yes or no. Don't put yes or no in the, um, you know, in, in the Zoom chat. Okay. So James, are you ready? Yes, thanks. Let me uh, share my slides again. Okay, thank you. Okay, can you can you see the slides and uh, can you see me change them? Yes. Perfect. Yeah. Okay, thanks a lot. Um, so welcome back, uh, everybody. Um, we'll have kind of a simple session today, just to just to follow up um, the the simple exercises for homework that you're given, um, as well as to field any any questions. Um, so we have just. Um, a bit less than an hour before the the lecture portion start. Um, so so let me remind you again. Still for today, um, for this next hour, use you can use this uh, software Slack channel to to ask your questions. Um, as after this session, we'll move to to other channels. So the the homework exercises. Um, the first one was, I hope, very very simple, uh, just to get updates from uh, the Jetscape uh, Git repository. Um, so I, I wanted to um, just check that this worked successfully for everybody. Um, so to to make sure that you have the um, the, the correct version of Jetscape after this update. Um, it, it can be good to also just open your terminal. Um, you can do this from outside the Docker container and enter into the Jetscape um, uh, location, uh, the Jetscape directory, and then check run this git log command that's highlighted here um, just to print out uh, what are the last git commits that were made to this repository. And hopefully you will see also um, something that tells you a uh, tag version 3.1.0, which is the most uh, um, the most recent uh, up-to-date version of Jetscape that we want everybody to be running. Um, so to to also kind of recalibrate today to make sure everybody's on board, let's so get, give this a try just to um, go to your Jetscape directory and check the run this git log command um, and check that you see this version 3.1.0. Um, so if you if you do that, please uh, enter a yes into the Zoom as usual. If you have some problem, enter a no. So let's just take a minute to, to make sure everybody gets up to speed with that. Um, can can I ask the chairs what uh, what we look like in terms of yes no? We have, we have uh, sixty yes, two no. So I think we can go ahead. If you or sixty uh, sixty eight 
and four no's. If if you're at a no, um, I think uh, go to the Slack channel to get some help. Or do you, do you want to take another minute? Well, uh, let, maybe uh, let's see. I see some people are typing into the Slack, so let's, let's give just a few moments to make sure any more no's don't pile up. Um, but yes, please uh, write into the Slack if you have some issue and we'll follow up to clarify that. Um, so, so, okay, some people write that um, you, you're not seeing actually this tag version 3.1.0, but you do see the most recent commit is this July 11 update readme. In that case, it's also fine. Um, this, this can depend maybe on your Git setup a little bit, or also if you execute this from inside the Docker container, I think you, for example, might not see this. Um, so as long as you see either of these two, the version 3.1.0 or this July 11 update readme, um, that's perfectly fine and you're, you're good to go. Thanks for checking that one. Okay, we're, we're at 87 yes and down to two no's. So hopefully everyone's gonna have it work. Uh, one no. So it sounds like the problems are getting resolved. Okay, perfect. Um, let's let's go ahead and move on then. Um, we should have a little buffer time today, I think, as well, to, to get everybody caught up. Um, okay, so I, I want to also just point out to you, um, since I didn't explicitly mention it yesterday, uh, how, how things work with the Jetscape releases. Um, some of you may be familiar with this and some of you not. So if you go actually to the GitHub page uh, for Jetscape um, and you, uh, there's, there's a link to releases there that you can find. Um, exactly this link that's, that's copied onto the slide here. Um, this will take you to a page which shows you all the Jetscape releases that have ever been made. Um, and at the top will be the most recent one. So you see here this Jetscape 3.1.0 is, is the latest release. Um, and in general, you should, if you're running Jetscape, you should just run whatever is the latest release available. Um, generally, this will be exactly equal to the master branch if you just do a, a git clone or um, git pull to update your, your Jetscape um, repository. You can find, of course, some more details as, as new releases are made, just what type of modules have been fixed or what type of improvements have been made. You can also directly download the code from these links here if you like. Um, instead of, instead of. Um, and, and just one, um, one more thing is that you can also, of course, check out releases directly with Git. Um, so for those of you who are maybe more thinking to, to develop things or, or more comfortable with Git, you can just from your command line type git tag to list all the possible um, tags that are currently available. Um, sometimes you will need to fetch from the repository to, to get new tags to appear. I'll leave you to kind of Google these git things if you're not familiar with them. Um, and then you can, for example, with this command at the bottom, check out any particular tag that, that appears in that list um, and, and use that. So th this is more for reference as opposed to um, that you should do anything now, um, but just so, so, you, so you have this information. And what, what might be also useful to some of you is on the main um, GitHub page for, for Jetscape, uh, there is a button at the top right that you can click to, to watch the Jetscape repository, as it's called, which means you'll be notified of any new releases uh, that come. So for those who want to keep up to date, um, you, can, you can control also exactly how often you want to be emailed, um, but this allows you a way, um, this is kind of the way that, that you should subscribe to get updates um, to, to Jetscape releases. Okay.
So now let's um, let's go on to just review the second piece of the homework, which was slightly less trivial, but hopefully also very simple um, or successful in the end, which was to build Jetscape with these external packages. Um, so I just want to test that this actually worked for everybody. Um, so there were some, um, some people it seemed had some issue, which I wanted to highlight that um, you might notice a problem that when you run CMake, you get some errors. Um, and as long as you make sure you're running from inside the Docker container, um, you should be quite confident that things will work successfully. So a good just kind of tip to have in mind is you sometimes um, might need to remove the build directory and repeat this procedure. Um, there's just sometimes some caching things can happen from CMake, which will, depending if you change configurations in some uh, particular way or had some kind of problematic uh, build configuration, this can create some cached files that, um, that the easiest way to get around that is just remove the build directory since everything here is kind of um, temporary that we create. Of course, be aware if you put any extra files there to, um, to move them elsewhere before deleting it. Or if, for example, you generated some big Jetscape output file, make sure you move that elsewhere before you actually remove this. Um, but then, then you can kind of restart, rerun the CMake commands from scratch and, and rebuild um, Jetscape. So this is, this is just, um, if you have trouble now or in the future, uh, give that a try. So I wanted to do a simple check that we actually built these packages, these external packages successfully so that we don't run into problems um, later in the physics ses sessions and that we really focus on the physics once we get there. Um, so to do this, uh, let's go now inside your Docker container. Um, hopefully you still have this, this available open from yesterday. Um, we'll be using it, of course, a lot in the remaining sessions as well. So, so keep it at your fingertips. And then um, enter the build directory of Jetscape. And then let's run this command um, here. Uh, so it's the same run Jetscape command that we've usually been running, except now we're going to pass it a different um, user configuration. So this is a file that already exists in the config directory of Jetscape. And we're not going to look at all into the physics of what's happening here, but this is really just a technical test um, for us to make sure that we've, we've built the external modules. So when, when you run this, um, so, so go ahead and give it a try. Um, and if, if the chairs could also clear out the yes, no answers um, and let me know once that's done. Yes, they've been cleared. Perfect. Thank you. Um, so, so go ahead. If this works for you, um, and by works, what I mean is uh, you look into the output and similar to yesterday when, when the Jetscape, uh, um, when, when it's initializing and you see these printouts to the screen, um, check explicitly that you see a line that says it added music to the task list. And you can also see a bit below that circle the um, added is ISS to the, to the task list. Um, if you see that, then everything is working correctly. So you don't need to pay attention to anything that goes on in the script below that. Um, uh, we don't need actually that to work. We just need this initialization to work for this technical check. If on the other hand, you see some error message that says music has not been installed or ISS has not been installed, um, then that means you have a problem with uh, the installation of the external packages. So if it works for you, go ahead and enter a yes into the, the with your zoom button. And if it has some problem, enter a no. I hope uh, this this should work successfully for people who successfully built the external packages. So let's give a moment for answers to come in there.
We're at five no's and 76 yes. Okay, so yeah, some, some people, um, so, so if, you, if you see a message that music is attempted to be added, but it is not installed, that really means you have not successfully installed um, music. So um, in that case, you want to go back to, to those instructions and try them again um, and pay attention if there is some error message that, that comes out. Um, you know, you can you can try to look at that and see see what it indicate is wrong, and if you can't figure out the problem, write it on Slack as well. Um, let me remind you. I would suggest also to people who tried to build uh, with these CMake options and it still is not working, try try what's outlined on this slide to just remove completely your build directory. Um, uh, and then start again. So make a new build directory, enter that, and then try the cmake commands, and then run this make command. So th there are some people then writing, uh, they get some warning message that comes later in the script. So again, as said, nothing beyond this point that is circled here in the script matters at all for this. This is just a technical check to make sure that um, these external packages exist. Um, so don't worry if you see something saying the input freeze out temperature is too low, don't worry at all. That's the only thing you need to check here is that this, um, you see these circled parts. So for, I see a, cu a couple of people do seem to have problems that music is not installed. So in that case, um, it does take a few minutes to, to rebuild things successfully. So that may be something also to um, continue to troubleshoot now, um, as well as after the session, um, we'll stay, uh, keep it, we'll, we'll keep our attention on the Slack to, to help with any troubleshooting problems. Um, but for those who do have issues, uh, really make sure that you can get this working before any of the physics sessions happen. Um, so you still, you can take, for example, the rest of today to uh, get that get that sorted out. Um, but you really do want to make sure it's going to be assumed that, that this is working um, for the following sessions. Okay, and how is our yes, no tally looking? 80 yes, 7 no. Okay, let, let's... Um, let, let's take a few minutes also to, to wait for these people to, to try to catch up um, and post if you have any additional questions on the Slack. So the, on, the only error that I've seen, so out of these people who say no, they run the script and they, they see a message that music is attempted to be added, but it is not installed. Um, so for this, really, you should just try again, um, uh, paying attention to the, the specific commands on this, this slide here. If anything's unclear about what to do, um, just let us know. And make sure, of course, again, that you run these instructions from inside your Docker container. So to those who this actually works, um, 
this is this is all all that you need to have ready for the next sessions. Um, and while while we wait, also for additional people to catch up or or ask if they have um, particular confusions about the steps. Um, we're gonna, it looks like we'll have some time today, this morning to um, to field also any additional questions you have about either the lecture yesterday or the hands-on session yesterday or um, just any further questions about the framework itself. So feel free in the meantime to type your, any questions you have into the Slack channel um, and we'll start uh, addressing those as well. Okay, and how, how is the tally looking now? Are you getting any improvement? 84 yes, but still seven no. I see, okay. So I, I think it, it, it does take a, a little bit of time. Um, you know, it can take maybe 15 minutes to actually rebuild everything from scratch. So, so I think let's, let's move ahead. And um, for those who are having problems, uh, just make sure to follow up on the Slack if, if you can't get things working. Um, if that's the case, uh, please make sure to also uh, write in the Slack exactly um, what you have run. So a screenshot of your terminal or, or the explicit commands and where you're running them, which will help us give you uh, advice. Um, okay, so, so that's, that's all um, actually the, uh, for the, the follow-up to the homework that I wanted to discuss today. So, we have still about a half hour of time free before the next uh, lecture session starts. So in that, I want to just field some general questions. Um, if, if we don't have many, there's, there's one or two other things I can uh, quickly show to you. Um, I see a couple of questions coming in on the, the Slack channel. Um, so one question, um, is under normal circumstances, is it best to continue to run Jetscape in Docker or better to run outside Docker? Um, so to, to clarify um, for everybody, so we, we can run Jetscape as we've done in this school from inside a Docker container, or the alternative is one can, you can do a manual installation where, um, so that this was linked in the slides yesterday um, that, that there is an installation page on the Jetscape GitHub uh, website, which allows you, it contains instructions of what packages, what prerequisite packages you need in order to, to kind of 
manually set up a system that can run Jetscape. Um, we, we really don't have any significant preference between these two options. Um, Doc, Docker is really provided as a convenience. So in, for the purposes of the school, to be clear, we're using it um, really just because we want to ensure everybody can use a uniform software environment um, since otherwise it's just too difficult to, to troubleshoot everything. Um, but the, the actual performance um, when you run Jetscape in Docker or outside of Docker uh, should be very similar, um, at least unless you don't have some problem in how you've set up Docker or how much memory or CPU power you, you allocate to Docker. As long as you um, give Docker the you know, very similar amount of, of memory and computing power to your normal machine, it, there's really no, no preference. Um, personally, I like to run it inside Docker because I can, I can go from machine to machine and as long as I can run Docker, I can run Jetscape and I know I'll get exactly the same output. So it's, it's very reproducible and I, um, you, you have to do much less manual work to, to double check that, um, that, that there's not some problem with some particular prerequisite package or the version of some package or something like this. Um, but beside that, it's, it's really completely up to you. Uh, but thanks, thanks for that question. That was, that's a good point. So James, there was a request to return to the previous slide so people could, um, could guess. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Thank Um, so, okay, so I, I will try to read off more questions from the Slack. Also, the chairs, if you, since there are a few more coming in, please feel free to interrupt or ask um, particular questions as well. Um, so let's see, there, there is a question about uh, the custom module. So it says, when we added the custom module, um, this custom module jet energy loss, J-E-L, in the XML file, it included the module myjel.cc with the same name, but the do energy loss function needs to have the same parameters and same name, and only the, the lines inside can change. So, so the question, if I understand correctly, is whether the arguments of this function, do energy loss, and the name of this function should be the same if we implemented a different um, version of that module. So the answer there is yes, if you're implementing a jet energy loss module. Um, so if you're doing that, uh, you should just use the same arguments of that function and the same name of that function. Um, if you're implementing a different type of module, so if you're implementing, say, a, a hydrodynamics module or hadronization module, then uh, the function name and the function arguments will be different. Um, uh, uh, several of the modules you will want to implement a function just called exec. Um, and for, th for these details, so this is also written on the slides from yesterday, which you can go back to, to look at. Um, for details, you, you may need to look either in this Jetscape manual, this archive link uh, that, that we posted, or else um, you can also take a look directly in the code, which so sometimes is just the easiest thing to do as well. Um, look at an example of a jet energy loss module and um, you, can, you can take a look there. So, so actually, since that's mentioned, I will take a moment to do something to slightly different. So let me change the screen that I'm sharing. Okay, so you should now see um, uh, the Jetscape GitHub page that I that I'm sharing. Please let me know if you have some issue with that. 
And so what I want to highlight to you is just uh, very briefly, what is kind of the directory structure of the Jetscape repository in case, so in case you want to develop your own module, um, this might be useful for you. So if you look, you, you can scroll around here and if you scroll down, you will see, first of all, a bunch of documentation instructions for kind of getting started with Jetscape. Um, so most all of this should be, was covered yesterday questions about installation, running Jetscape, some basics of how these configuration files work. Um, you'll see links also to um, more installation instructions as well as the, the Jetscape manual here. Um, but what I want to highlight is what out of these, these code directory structure is most relevant for you. So one thing, first let me just point out there is this config directory that we've been using. And if you click on this, you will see that there are several examples of these XML files. So you see the, the Jetscape master XML file, which is the one that you, you might often look for reference of what type of parameters you can run with Jetscape. Um, but again, you shouldn't typically modify. And then there is this file Jetscape user pp19.xml, which we were using quite a bit yesterday. Um, and there are several others that um, that you can also glance at if you're curious as just kind of examples of different ways to connect modules together. Um, then the, the, there, is, um, there is a folder for the external packages as well, uh, which contains a bit of documentation um, specific to each of these, which we're not going to actually spend any time on and any specifics that matter for the school will we'll go into. Um, but just to be aware that there is some information about the external packages there. Now, the, the main directory that I want to highlight for you is this source directory here. And so if you click on this one, you will see a bunch of different folders. And so what's, uh, you will see most of them are labeled with different kind of physics names. Um, so there is one called Afterburner. There is um, there's one called framework, uh, which is actually not specific to physics modules, but the general framework classes. And there's hadronization, hydro, initial state, jet, and, and a few others. And so if you, um, if you wanted to implement a jet energy loss module and you want to look at what are the currently existing modules, you can click into this jet folder of the source directory. And you'll see a bunch of examples. So for example, there is this ADS CFT um, energy loss module that's implemented. And you know, you, these, these can be a, a bit full. So they, but you see here, there's a function defined called init and clear. And we see this function do energy loss. Um, there are also some user defined functions that you don't need to implement. So to, to see which functions you really need to implement, you can look, um, you can look into the manual or, or the slides here, um, which again, I emphasize will be a bit different depending on what type of module you, you implement. And then you, you can look inside the, the CC file at that function for, for full details of how it's working. Um, and that, that can be very useful for you to see, um, to see examples of how does one create new parton objects to, to return back uh, to the framework, for example. Okay, so, so that's just a reference which can be useful um, if you're developing your own modules. Now, the, there is also a framework directory here, which we won't go into detail, but this, this contains classes that for the most part, if you're contributing a module, you, you don't have to, you shouldn't modify. Um, but th there are kind of the full scope of what the framework actually does, how it steers things, as well as how some of the base modules are defined. Um, that appears in this framework directory. So, okay, with that, I'll stop uh, sh sharing this and go back to the PDF. Um, so I hope that was kind of a long follow-up to the question about um, defining custom modules, but please also follow up if, 
if that doesn't answer your question or if there is something additional you'd like to know. So I see a variety of technical questions coming in. Um, those, those I think, so the, the very technical ones are, will be best to just answer on Slack itself. Um, some of the TAs are around helping with this and I see also some of the other students are helping, which, which I appreciate very much. So uh, there is a question, what are the different values in different columns in the output files from Jetscape? So like the test out dot dat or test out dot hepmc. Um, so these, uh, these files can, can be a little bit complicated in the sense that they have many, many things and they're not completely explained within the file themselves. There are some comments explaining what is there. Um, but for this, uh, this really contains the full event information. So in the slides yesterday, I showed uh, kind of the, the main or kind of the important information, I think, at least in a, on a basic level of what is actually contained in those files. So we, we looked um, a little bit at the, the test out.dat file, and we see that there is a little bit of event information that is initialized. And then at some point, there is a list of say partons or list of hadrons. And then there are um, a bunch of kinematic variables defining basically the four vectors of those partons and um, any additional information like the, the particle ID and whatnot. Um, so for this, if you're, most of the time, if you're uh, creating this test out dot dat in the ASCII format, um, you are you often want to just create only the final state hadrons or final state partons from there. And for those, I, I showed a little more explicitly, and I think it's actually labeled explicitly at the top of the final state hadrons file or final state partons file when you create that, um, what each of those columns exactly is. So that, that one is, is labeled, so it should be clear what you find. Um, for the HEPMC file, that's also, um, not necessarily obvious what is what is in there. Um, but the HEPMC file is a particular format which um, it it stores uh, basically, it, it has basically a graph structure inside. So it, it's made up of a collection of um, what, what they call edges and nodes comprising a graph. Um, and these uh, these basically encode the, the parton shower uh, history itself, as well as the final, including the final state partons. And there is separately from this a, um, what is it kind of, what's called a disjointed graph, or, or just basically, a, that means a separate graph from the parton shower history, which contains the final state hadrons. Um, and so this, you know, some of these details get, get uh, a bit, much to go over right now, but um, that's also part of why I wanted to point you to this Jetscape analysis repository that we worked with yesterday, um, because in there you can find actually um, full working examples of how to extract either the final state hadrons or final state partons from either of these uh, output formats. Um, so I, I would say take a look um, at those references that I mentioned. And if you if you do have some more specific follow-up questions or things that we can try to document better, um, please also feel free to write us.
So uh, I see also a question, what did the custom module that we ran yesterday actually do? Um, which is a very good question. So this, this custom module, it does uh, uh, essentially nothing, but it's kind of a dummy module, an empty module uh, that we can fill in uh, to our liking if we wanted to implement some, some jet energy loss code. So the, the function do energy loss in this specific case it takes as an argument some input partons and it is expected to output some uh, vector of partons. And then it's completely up to you in that function um, what you want to do. So currently it just prints out some information about the, the partons it receives and doesn't actually do anything um, with them. Uh, so this, is, this, is, uh, this exercise was really um, just on a technical side what did we have to do to get that custom module added to the framework? So, so that whatever we decide to code into that do energy loss module gets actually run by the framework. So there, there were a few steps um, which we went through showing what's necessary there. Um, but if you wanted to implement some actual physics that, that would need to come um, uh, on your own inside that do energy loss function or the appropriate function um, if it's a different type of module. So I see still just a few kind of technical questions remaining, which we try to get to as soon as we can. Um, I, I, at the moment, I'm not seeing any more general questions, um, but the chairs or TAs, if you see anything, please let me know also. So James, there is, um, there you're now at 91 yeses and three noes. Uh, on the last assignment. And there was a question about root at some point back. I think it's, I don't know if you need to address that or you want to send that off to Chuck. Um, okay, I, I don't see exactly what that question is actually. Oh, it's pinned. Ah, it's pinned, okay, let me take a look. Yeah, this, this I, I think, um, I, I see there are some replies going in a thread here. So I think let's, let's follow this one up uh, just on Slack. Um, again, if, if other people, if you see a question that's posted and you see the same problem, uh, please make sure to, to like that, that post. Um, otherwise, if it's, if it's just a problem that kind of one person is having, we'll deal with that. Uh, individually on, on Slack. Um, but if, if many people are having that problem or several people, then I'll try to address it in the main section. I think some people are asking to, to go back on the slides. Um, so I, I remind you also, you should be able to access all of these on the Indico page. Um, so you can go download them and go to any slide that you like. And maybe maybe it's worth. So I, I see some question a bit related to 
um, running code on some type of batch system or distributed computing. Um, so this is something that I, I haven't talked about and is, is kind of beyond the scope of what we can instruct uh, from the Jetscape side. Often, if, if you want to do some major production of events, Jetscape events, you often want to use your, your local computing cluster or some other kind of distributed computing. Um, how you should run Jetscape there, whether you try to run it in Docker or some manual installation, that, that really is specific to, to the system that you have set up. Um, some, some clusters will allow you to run Docker or um, there's something called Singularity, which some systems run, which is uh, a way that a Docker image can be run. Um, some systems may not allow you to run Docker, in which case you would need to um, get the, the prerequisite packages from the manual installation installed on that system. Um, so that's, yeah, that, that's a detail we can't really go into here, but um, just to be aware of, uh, you know, what, what we talk about here today is really focused on running on your laptop and geared hopefully in the remainder of the school also to uh, the physics side of things of what's actually inside Jetscape. Um, but if you want to run some major productions of events, um, that will take some computing considerations which are specific to, to your, um, to, to the system or cluster that you would be running on. Okay, so I see that the questions are slowing down a bit coming in, although there are still some technical, um, still some technical questions coming. So for those ones, we just continue to follow up on the Slack, um, and we have we have just a few minutes before the the session time is running out today. So this is I'll give kind of last call also for general questions about the framework. Uh, but aside from this, uh, as long as you've completed the steps, you should be completely set up for the rest of the sessions. So I see there is a question how to run some custom examples that are listed in the Git page. Um, so this, uh, at least uh, for now, um, you, sh you don't need to do this at all. This is a little more technical. Um, there, there are ways, so um, I, I don't wanna go in much detail since I don't have the uh, slide about this. Um, if, if you want to run some things that are in this custom examples directory, um, it's maybe best to, to just ask us uh, specifically what you want to run. Um, and you, there you may need to really uh, change some, change a setting and come recompile um, Jetscape depending what, what kind of configuration you have. Um, but for, for kind of the main standard way of running Jetscape, you shouldn't need to, um, to do any of these things. And if, if you don't know what I'm talking about with that question, don't, don't worry either. That's kind of an extra, extra step that, that we don't need to do.
So I, I don't see um, more questions really coming in at this point. Um, so I, I'll leave it to the chairs, but I, I might suggest that we can uh, close and then allow a 10 minutes break before the lectures start. Um, please, uh, to, to all of you listening, um, again, feel free to follow up, uh, especially on any technical questions that you run into on this channel. Um, and we'll try to keep looking at this uh, later today. Um, if not, uh, I'll just remind you, make sure you've completed all these steps uh, from yesterday and from the follow-up uh, homework in the slides today, then you should be all set for the, the physics sessions that will follow. Um, so do, do the chairs want to want to take back over now? Yeah, we can do that. I think we're just going to take a break, right? Yeah, I, I would propose uh, let's just close this, this session for the next eight minutes and we come back in eight minutes for when the lecture piece starts. Um, and so it doesn't yeah. seem to have any, anything more for, for now. So th thanks a lot to everybody. Um, and yeah, we will see you then in, in eight minutes. Okay. Thanks, James.